Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will start today's episode where we will be talking to one Nicole Lowbury de Bruin. Nicole has been a veterinarian since the late 1980s and has worked exclusively on companion animal behavior since 2016. She is a member of the ANZCVS, Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Sciences and Veterinary Behavior, and she operates a private practice, Animal Sense, for companion animal behavior issues in Perth, Western Australia. Nicole has been a member of staff at Murdoch University Veterinary School since 2007, teaching clinical behavior medicine to undergraduate veterinary students. She loves to pass on knowledge to others through presenting and using case studies to illustrate the enormous array of behavior problems in their various treatment protocols. She is passionate about educating others on the need for kind, scientifically sound ways to change behavior. At the heart of her work is a goal for increased empathy between human and the animals with whom we share the world. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Nicole to the show today, who's patiently waiting by on the west coast of Australia. Nicole, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Thanks, Ryan. Good to be here. Uh, It's fantastic to have you here. We're going to dive straight into the episode today, Nicole, with our first question. Uh, For this one, I was hoping that you could please share with the listeners, take us back to where you got started, back to the 80s or, or earlier, mm. uh, where, you, where <laughs> you first started working with animals, working with behaviour, where you first learned about training, positive reinforcement. Share some stories with us from your journey. Yeah, yeah. I was really uh, pretty slow on the uptake, actually. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say, Um as a veterinarian for for a couple of decades probably i was least interested in behavior very worried about dealing with any animals that had issues that i actually probably wrongly assumed was the the fault of of the owners um yeah so i was really really super ignorant um about behavior as a as a even uh, area of veterinary medicine and what actually happened was in in my day-to-day work i had a an animal come to us that had a foreign body obstruction a corn cob actually in its abdomen and the owners decided that they couldn't afford the corrective surgery to remove this corn cob and i rightly or wrongly um, suggested that they relinquish the dog to us and that i would do the surgery and my <laughs> naive uh, self thought because uh, i was between dogs i thought i'll, I'll take take this dog home you know I'll repair it and she's a beautiful dog she'll be a great great dog um so I did the surgery and that all went okay and she recovered she was very sweet in clinic but actually (laughs) when she was at home and really from the very first walk that we we took her on discovered that she had very serious dog reactivity to the point of really wanting to injure other dogs. And I mean, it might, it does seem surprising to me and to you, no doubt, that that this was kind of a new problem to me. 
I, I hadn't really experienced this um, in any of my previous dogs. Um, and I don't know, I don't think clients had really, uh, certainly I wasn't the one that they had talked to about these issues. So I was pretty much like any any client with, with a dog with reactivity and anxiety that they've never come across before, very unsure about what to do. And and um, this is this is in the early two thousands. Um, so I, I I reached out to trainers, and I had um, at least two trainers that were disparate <laughs> from each other. One that was recommending kind of leadership, strong control corrective techniques and then another one that was was using food and um, obviously a positive reinforcement based trainer although I didn't know those terms even then um, but what struck me was that the that they were so different from each other and and it made me think how come I don't know what, what I'm supposed to do here you know as a veterinarian I, I, shouldn't I know which is the right way um and so that that actually was the how I began that journey was was actually trying to sort out for myself uh how do you fix a dog like this or or what can be done to fix a dog like this and and I must admit that I was very um I don't think I'm probably alone in saying that as a veterinarian from the 1980s, I'm alone in not knowing much about behaviour. But certainly um, there were obviously even at that time lots of vets who did know about behaviour and uh, I was certainly wasn't one of them. And, um, you know, I began the journey from there and I, I started with a course at at Sydney Uni, which was a postgraduate year-long course on on the clinical uh, behavioural medicine that Kirsty Sexel uh, ran, and I think still does run. And uh, she's a specialist veterinary behaviourist. And it was through her course and certainly other training conferences and things that I started to go on. I went to a Susan Friedman course. I went to as much behavior uh, courses as I could. I, I began to be, you know, become educated and informed. I never really, it took me a while even then to, 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 to see that that, that was a passion to, to just, to just work with behavior. But by the time I finished the year long course, um, and Kirsty was suggesting to people who were doing the course that they should sit their membership exams that I thought, you know what, maybe I could do this. And, and obviously not everybody who sits their membership exams decides to work solely in behavior. There's often still working as generalized practitioners. Um, but yeah, I just became more and more engrossed and a little bit, um, obsessed <laughs> with it and it's it snowballed from there so it's been a it's been a good journey so tell, take us back and, and tell us what happened when you got this dog from this client of yours and discovered that it had these behavioral challenges with regards to how it behaved on the leash I think I, if I'm remembering correctly around other dogs mm, mm. and you went oh I've never dealt with this before what as a coming coming from a veterinary level of analysis mm. and and mm. getting those conflicting bits of advice what what was the next step for you and that dog yeah well as I say I was very um inexperienced we we did both uh, for a while we did both methods so pretty confusing probably for the dog um uh, you know, as we'd try a little bit of uh, training with, with well, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was aver aversive. So, I mean, we weren't using prong collars or things like that, but it was just, it was mainly just trying, it was probably flooding, uh, you know, walking around in close proximity, lots of other dogs and just trying to get the dog used to it. It was, it was a, obviously not useful. Um, but, you know, and again, you can see how, how for for clients if if they're recommended to do these things by people they trust trainers they're going to try and do the best job they can so we did that my partner went and did that I wasn't physically even strong enough to to even control the dog at all so he he was kind of tasked with doing that um and then the dog I mean 
we, it was a dog that you couldn't take out during the daylight hours after a while it was a dog that that was was um you know you walked at night <laughs> in the in the in the dark of night scared to death avoiding people avoiding um well not avoiding people as much i mean she was she was fine with people but of you know she was a appeasing and very anxious dog i didn't medicate her i didn't really have any understanding of how that could have assisted her in those days um so she wasn't medicated and she ended up being relinquished because we couldn't we we couldn't um get her to the point where we felt she was safe uh for us as a family to be able to have and she didn't she just certainly didn't fit our our goals as a pet dog but yeah when I think about it now I, I do feel um I guess we failed her but we also um she was the start of our or my learning journey um so for that I'm grateful but but I really had no concept of the length of time that it could take what to rightly expect to achieve and and no one actually um well, I didn't know who to turn to, but there wasn't anybody giving me any advice. So I was um, discovering these things on my own. Um, so I, I do keep her in mind when I <laughs> have clients come to me who are, who are, who this has come out of left field for them. You know, they may be on their fifth dog and they've never had a dog with an anxiety related disorder and they, they, they're perplexed, very perplexed. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. And what I can say is now this will be episode 201 of our podcast and in the 201 episodes, the amount of times we've heard stories where the guests of our show, highly respected, highly skilled, highly knowledgeable, uh, professionals in our industry now weren't always that way, obviously. So, uh, you know, a lot of our guests share similar stories to you, Nicole, and, and I can understand that feeling of failure. Like you were, you failed them. I mean, I'm the same. I had, I had an animal that I uh, used diversives with before I knew anything. And um, like, like you, I still have gratitude, even though I feel sorry for them. I've, I've gratitude that I can carry everything I've learned from that time to now. And if I knew better, I would have done better then. So you're definitely, definitely not alone there. So what, what, what happened next then? Did you go, okay, well, that what that caught my interest and I'm going to go looking for these cases now? Or did somehow, or maybe you were thinking about it, so you just picked things from your environment that were always there, but now you're mm. picking them. And what, how did you How did you kind of navigate from there to where you are now? Yeah. Well, I mean, the other, the other thing to me that as I learned, as I learned more and more about animal behavior, what, what struck me was that that was actually why I was a vet in the first place, you know, was, was that connection between the human and the animal. I mean, I had wanted to be a vet since, you know, five, six years old. So I'd, I'd always wanted to be a vet. But certainly after a couple of decades working in small animal practice, you know, being a routine vet and having animals, um, you know, be frightened of you and avoiding of you and not want to come into the vet and everything, there, there's a bit of, <laughs> there's a, bit of a, a, a killing of the love of veterinary science. And yet when I, when I um, then immersed myself in behaviour and started to see the veterinary in from the dog's point of view and actually work with the dog instead of against the dog I actually started to really love love it again I suppose um, and realized that you know that's actually where I want to to be working is is helping people maintain and improve that 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 relationship with their dog I I you know I I I don't know through osmosis uh, believed in a lot of mythology of dog ownership you know oh this dog's you know badly behaved oh this dog is badly behaved because of you know the way the client 
the client um, is rather than, you know, understanding that, that you know, it, what the human does can can change the way the dog behaves. So, so I, that mythology had crept into my whole understanding and it wasn't until I, I was re-educated that I, that I, it, and then it was like light bulb moment really for me, um, learning, learning about learning theory, learning, um, about positive reinforcement, learning about how animals learn, learning about the brain, all of that stuff was just made sense. And, and when it made sense, uh, it was just so easy. It, it, it um, felt, you know, I'm just sounding evangelical now, but <laughs> it felt like coming home to, oh, this is this is what I should be doing. It was great. It was really great. And I'm I'm curious. You you talked about in the early 2000s coming across this problem and not having experienced before. Even even by that stage, you you had been in the industry for 20 years, right? Yeah. And well, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, we used to, I think as a vet clinic, we used to send people off to whatever dog training, uh, you know, card person who were in our area without even really knowing what they did. Uh, we were probably all lucky in that we all had, you know, relatively normal animals ourselves. So we we didn't, you know, if if they were anxious. I mean, you've got to remember too, you know, when I graduated, um, 1987 I graduated, that was the year they discovered Prozac. So, you know, like there was, there was no behavioural kind of medication being used. There was, there was very... It was a time when um, the brain, the 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 imaging of the brain was kind of just beginning. Um, you know, it wasn't. We were still sterilizing animals, um, for instance, and not using pain relief after routine operations because we didn't think dogs felt pain. <laughs> so, you know, things have come a long way, um, a long, long way. I mean. It, in, in a relatively short period of time through through lots of increased understanding. But, you know, I, I graduated in a time where, you know, veterinary schools were still doing surgeries on, um, on animals and then three days later euthanizing them, you know, as practice. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't know any of that. Thank, thank you for yeah. sharing. Yeah. For those in the... Australasian region, and this is only something I've learned about. You talked about your uh, in, in 2016, or maybe it was earlier than yeah, that. Yeah, two, two, sat- 2015, I sat my uh, college membership exam. Right. And mm. and so for us in the Australasian region and, and for those mm. in other parts of the world, maybe you can add um, your understanding of what it's like in other parts of the world. Um, what does what does that mean? I was yeah, you know, okay. I was I yep. was reading um got it in front of me, Leslie McDevitt's Control Unleashed book from the US and it says in there mm. you should see a board certified veterinarian. Yes. But if you're yes. in Australia, then that doesn't yes. mean anything. So what yes. what what does what does this exam mean? Yes. So um we do have in Australia, I'm not sure about New Zealand, if whether you have any actual specialists that would be equivalent to board certified. Um, certainly in Australia, on the east coast of Australia, there are uh, probably half a dozen or so, maybe less, uh, veterinary specialists, behaviour specialists, and they're, they're people like Kirsty, Trefina, Jackie, um, and they they are either ha- have their specialty because they are, have become fellowed with the Australian College of Veterinary Science or they are board certified in the American system, or they have um, a specialist qualification with the European system. And I think Kirsty has all three, actually. <laughs> um, but so in, a, in the Australian system, to be a registered specialist, you are a fellow of the Australian College of Veterinary Scientists. Um, 
and I'm certainly not one of those. I'm a member and a member is, is I guess, the first tier of that specialty uh, qualification. So some areas of veterinary science don't have that first tier and some do. So for instance, um, dermatology in Australia only has a fellowship level. There's no middle tier So you have to do small animal medicine and then from that membership of small animal medicine, then you could go forward, do work for, usually it's something like about three years work under a specialist to then sit that specialist exam. So um, when you're a member like me, we don't call ourselves, um, obviously we're not specialists, but we call ourselves behaviour veterinarians. Um, and some of us, some would would still do regular GP work, but there are a number of us who who only work in the field of veterinary behaviour. Um, and um, in certainly in the West Coast, we don't have any actual uh, registered specialists. So we have a number of members like me who who only do veterinary behaviour. And so the difference between us and your regular vet, I guess, is that because we only deal in behaviour, um, we, we structure our whole system around very long consults, um, working alongside, you know, dedicated positive reinforcement trainers. We get referrals directly from veterinarians who may be already begun a a small aspect of the of the treatment but don't know where to go from there or or maybe they've done a little bit of um work with the with the people but they don't have the resources to to put together a really comprehensive plan so a veterinary behavior um consult is is usually a minimum of you know one to two hours and they are quite um you know they take place after a lot of information has been collected so we have a like a 20 page questionnaire we try and collect a lot of video without provoking um the issue um of the animal and its life um we use a lot of we 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 collect a lot of um, historical information about how the dog has been reared as much as possible know about the stresses in its life um, its triggers and all of that kind of stuff and then you know in the in the process of the consult what we're doing is unpicking all that and helping the client both Um, understand why the dog is like that and then develop a plan where we will have um, training incorporated in that although we're not the trainers (laughs) and so um, yeah we we definitely uh, work alongside very good trainers but um, you know we're part of just part of that that cog in that wheel yeah so as trainers we obviously want veterinarians who understand behavior change and learning theory Mm. but one thing i've realized over the last couple of months is as i've learned the process that you just described about in the australasian region anyway obviously that's relevant for me sitting this exam and how few few of you there are in certain locations. Sure. Uh, even spread across New Zealand, as you said, you don't think we have a specialist here. Mm. Uh, I'm lucky uh, I live uh, within yeah. an hour or two people who have set yeah. the membership exam. But yeah. um, do, you, do you think there's a lack of people who have got that specialisation or is it mm. more people need to... How, how, how does one, if you're a trainer and you're listening to this mm. show and you live in Australia or, or Europe because and, and the US because there's rel- um, mm. there are organisations which do the same thing, we just, they just use different words to describe what they do. Um, what, what should you do if you, if you don't have a veterinary behaviourist? How do you how do you find one? How do you get in touch mm. with the closest person? Do they need to be the closest mm. person? Can they reach out to you and work with you from the East Coast? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so we do do we do we do help uh, regular veterinarians as well. Um, so you you know that's that's available. 
We also do do telehealth and remotely assist clients and then talk to their vets uh, about, you know, what they can do prescribing wise if we're not able to, to be the actual prescriber. So sometimes it's, you know, the veterinarian is, is the regular veterinarian might be um, not fully experienced with some of the medications that are generally prescribed. And so they just, you know, as the, as the prescriber, it's your job to be, you have to feel comfortable with, with what you're doing. And so if you're a, a veterinarian who, who isn't used to using medication, that can be a little bit scary. And, you know, therefore having someone um, help you uh, that that can be useful. I think for a client who doesn't, um, so say that the client is remote and, and doesn't have, you know, let alone uh, a veterinarian, <laughs> any veterinarian, they don't have a behaviour veterinarian, um, you know, they can they can still take advantage of, of um, remote veterinary behaviour consultation. Um, we, we can do quite a, a lot remotely, um, I feel. We do that because I guess we, we learnt to do that a bit more over COVID as well. Um, and I think so for Australia, certainly there's on the college website, there's a list of, of everybody who has got their membership in each state and so there's certainly a way to do that I think in America obviously there's there's something probably near like a hundred I suppose um, board certified veterinary behaviorists and, and I'm sure that a lot of those do work remotely as well and would also assist regular veterinarians in in remote consultation and vet to vet kind of consultation so yeah a hundred is still relatively small population I suppose wise. yeah for sure yeah I mean that's why you like you say that there, there is certainly room for more um we we have a very long uh wait time at animal sense and I guess that's because of the the kind of the length of time it you know takes to see each animal um so there is always a need for more and more and it just doesn't it doesn't fit with a normal veterinary uh, practice you see behavior because behavior <laughs> dogs dogs that have behavior problems don't want to go to the vet clinic they don't want to see other dogs you know it's all very difficult for it to occur in a normal vet clinic I mean I when I worked out of the uni which was a very busy veterinary hospital it was actually really hard to run a good veterinary behavior consult out of that environment and yet lots of people still do it that way but it is nice to have a center now that is that is large and um you know, we, we have decent gaps between each, you know, an animal is never walking in where another animal is going to be confronted. Um, you know, clients are, are very, uh, it's very non-stressful for them to bring their animal to our centre because it doesn't, it's not perceived as a veterinary clinic and we can make it really safe. We have a really, really, really safe setup, so that's much better than most of the environments in a in a normal veterinary hospital are really not that conducive to a good veterinary behaviour consult. Mm. And so some some vet behaviourists will will do home visits, which of course is really valuable as well, um, and gives you different information and and. Uh, that can work really well, but uh, as as a group, we don't we don't do that. We that and that's why we have the trainer do that. Obviously, the trainer is the home the home visiting person, and they'll give us a different impression of of perhaps certain things. Mm. And so, do I understand? Relatively recently, you've got a new facility. You just mentioned. Well, yeah. Well, no, I've <laughs> I've moved around a little bit since COVID. So the COVID thing stopped the consults happening at the veterinary hospital at Murdoch, and then we had a centre in North Frio for about two years. Now we're in an interim space in an industrial kind of zone, and we are building our own purpose built. Uh, facility now so in about the next little while we'll we'll be moving again um again you know we we have large large 
kind of open spaces because what we're mostly attempting to do, unless it's not safe to do so, is to have the dog free in the space with us so that we can absolutely let the dog choose avoidance (laughs) or whatever, um, you know, and be able to see it do its own thing without too much restriction on its movement. Yeah. I think most listeners of the show are going, wow, I wish my vet clinic was set up like that. So yeah. Yeah. What, what, what other, because you're building a new facility and that I can mm. imagine obviously is restrained by resources as everything else, but yeah. what, what, what other you know, unique nuanced considerations did you incorporate into into your planning? Did you manage with the resources you have to design it exactly how you wanted or is there some things you had to leave out? Uh, I don't think anything's ever exactly how we wanted. What would be really lovely would be like a site psych office with a two-way mirror and I could put all the students behind it <laughs> yeah that would be good wouldn't it um but but we do have we do have what we call the safe space which is like instead of um having the dog on lead if it's not safe um we can put it behind a barrier that that allows the dog to move and and be free in that in that kind of you know space and we we can attempt to see at what point we can maybe interact more safely with that dog so because I think um um, obviously, if you imagine a, a really small consult room, <laughs> that's what they were like at, at the university. And for some dogs who who don't want someone within a few meters of them, um, they had to be tethered at, and and to the wall for safety. And that that's not great, um, not great at all. And so try and avoid that if possible. Sometimes being obviously you would know. Sometimes being behind a fence can also make you worse um but again you know we can't we don't want to be bitten and we can't afford to be bitten so if if the dog is offensive then that it might be in that safe space while we conduct the consult with the client and sometimes the client is in the safe space with the dog <laughs> and we're all and we're, we're outside that um but sometimes we're both outside that and the dog is able to be in the safe space and and can cope with that on his own yeah and so your consults are a one to two hours longish you said yeah 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 so. and and a veterinary specialist might even be longer than that I've sat in quite a few um specialists uh consultations and they're generally three hours long um which is pretty intense and quite tiring for everybody <laughs> so we don't we we tend not to have that that longer consult um and I feel like we can uh do it mainly in the in the period that we have because we spend a lot of time getting all the information ahead of time we don't we do use the questionnaire as a as a jumping off place while we're talking to the client trying to explain maybe how the dog is like how he is and and why that's come about um, because that's in a way something that clients even though it might not change the outcome of what we do it's something that is in it's one of the questions that the client is curious about and you know sometimes also they might feel responsible or have some guilt attached to maybe what they've done and therefore it's a way of um, alleviating some of that and making them understand that what what's done is done and and let's let's move on from that but it can still be useful sometimes to highlight what things might have uh impacted the dog and and turned turned it into the way it behaves these days so yeah and is your are your clients the general populace who find you or are they being referred to by trainers how, how do you but both really I mean they don't need to um they they can come to us directly from their own accord because we're not specialists we're not registered specialists like if you go to see a, a veterinary dermatologist your vet needs to write a referral we don't need a referral. We do get lots of um, our clients through their regular vet who has said you should go and see uh, Nicole or Zoe at Animal Sense. And then we also get uh, initially, certainly when we first started the business, 
most of our referrals were from dog trainers who who recognised that oh okay here this is great this is these are vets who can help us and so it, it did start out mainly through trainers interestingly enough and and we still obviously get the cases through trainers but we also get a lot through veterinarians now so that's good it's good to see that veterinarians are now realizing that that they could help their clients more by getting them the right behavior plan it's really important yeah and i guess it would be quite scary for those vets to prescribe because they're often doing 15 20 minute consults aren't they yeah you can't... yeah yeah and i think that's absolutely true you know like because we you know we might not spend a lot of our consult uh, talking about the medicines but um they certainly get a lot of information written about the medicines as well um, which you probably don't get from your regular veterinarian um, and I think sometimes the reason that the if 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 the medicines and how they work haven't been fully um, explained to the to the client the client might okay perceive the medicines as either doing more than they they're capable of doing or quicker than they're capable of doing or you know go away with it with a with a misunderstanding of what it is that the medicines can do and and maybe that's even the veterinarian might not fully understand how the medicines work either um because that is quite complex so and if you're a veterinary behaviorist you 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 only really need to know about a small subset of stuff so you can obviously spend a lot of time learning about that and you know you don't have to know everything about you know the skin and the heart and the ear and the you know the well you you still do know those things but you don't have to keep keep up with the enormous amount that that your regular veterinarian is trying to maintain current knowledge of so yeah well that's an impossible task i think to maintain yeah. current knowledge on anything uh, i've mm. been doing this since 2007 and as uh Director of an animal training company, an international one, every month. I, I'm just blown away by how little I know. And and recently it's been yeah. learning about behavior vets and yeah. understanding that yeah. I you know, I haven't really even scratched the surface as a trainer. And I wonder how many trainers out there don't appreciate or understand. I mean, it's not like like you said, we're not understanding about the skin and all of that stuff. I think our job is to understand learning theory and apply the tools of that and have you on the team or someone with your skill set mm. on the team. Um, mm. But I, I, I have, uh, and I will say that on this podcast uh, uh, and feel quite vulnerable doing so, I just have such a huge lack of knowledge about mm. working with veterinary behaviorists and or behavior okay. vets and um, well, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I, I I agree that you, like you say, I mean, the <laughs> the more you get into an area, the the more you feel like you don't know, and uh, that happens to me as 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 well. You know, where where you know you you're getting kind of nervous about how much you don't know um, all the time. Um, the more you the more you study, the more you you realize how much there is to know about an area or a subject. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, I I feel like I in your so for your for you, in terms of your area and the training. I mean, I I trust my trainers to put together the training plan, <laughs> and you know I stay in my lane, um, which is kind of like an overseer of the whole plan. And but but I won't tell a trainer how to train. And, you know, I, I respect that, you know, their skill base means that they will put together a plan that works for that dog when I've said to them, you know, this dog needs work around handling or vet visits or this dog needs a greeting ritual for visitors. You know, I'm not going to then say, oh, this is how you should do the greeting ritual. Like I'll let them work out when they go and visit the home how that greeting ritual is going to be set up but I know that they need a greeting ritual 
people or I might know this dog uh, shouldn't be disturbed while sleeping. Can you go there and work out where is the best place for this dog to sleep and and how, you know, that that uh, baby gate should set, be set up there and what how are you going to instruct, you know, the rest of the family and but so – yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit like when I think um, like the trainer certainly has an ability if they're a good trainer and they're a good body language reader to say to me, this dog has anxiety, Nicole, do you want to see it for me? Because I need your help to get this dog in a, in a less stressed state so it can learn better. So like I have no problem at all with the, a trainer saying to me, this dog... <laughs> This dog needs medication. Um, I ex- I kind of expect a good trainer to be able to to tell the difference between a, an animal with a with a with a lack of training through not being exposed in the ways that we want versus a dog that can't learn because of its stress responses. Yeah, it's hard to, I think, build that knowledge. I think after I've been doing this for so long, or for as long as I've been doing it, (laughs) since 2007, I'm growing a greater appreciation of this. Uh, and and <clears throat> it's making me think about a video I watched of yours that I reached out to you about last month. We talked about, and, and this is a video that's available on your Animal Sense website for anyone that wants to go watch it. It was about well, why we medicate uh, and how that's, yep. how some of the medications work. But I think, I think it was in that video, Nicole. One thing you said mm-hmm. is... And, and I'm going to butcher how you said it, so you correct me. Something along the lines of, of people should people shouldn't be so worried about reaching out earlier. Yes. And that can can you talk to that? Because yeah. that, that's kind of where yeah. I am now. I'm like, if yeah. I'm really just you know after yeah. 15, 16 years, going, oh, you know, crap, I I haven't um, explored this uh, rela- these um, the importance of the relationships with behaviour vets as much as I should have. You know, is, what, is there lots of situations where it would have been beneficial for the end? users the clients and the yeah, animals to yeah. have to have have formed those relationships earlier um yeah can, can you speak to, that's not really a question but can, can you speak can you speak to that yeah 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 because we do we do see that on the questionnaire a lot you know that oh you know uh we don't want to use medicine but if you know we will if but it's as a last resort type of thing and um and again, we see them, we see animals much later in their life when, when certainly looking on the history, the red flags were always there and, and right, you know, sometimes right from puppyhood where they were hypersensitive, hyperactive, little mouthy <laughs> uh, terrorists that, that were, you know, having separation issues or slow to toilet train or, you know, incredibly destructive, you know, and again, these are things that are normal puppy things to some degree. But again, if, if you're a red flag puppy or an outlier, it's frequency, intensity, and duration of behavior that makes you go, oh, that's not normal mouthiness. That's a level of mouthiness that is, that is beyond normal puppy developmental phase. And so, you know, again, if you, if, and if you, if you're good at recognizing who's an outlier and the history is such that there are, 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 are factors in that history that suggest that that is a, a dog that could be being set up for an anxiety related disorder. And by that, I mean, you know, the mother is stressed, the mother is anxious, the mother is aggressive, the mother, <laughs> the, the puppies that maybe hand reared, the, you know, like there could be a whole lot of things that that, that they're not maybe prescriptive that you're going to have a problem, but they they are, are more likely to be um, in the history of a dog with a problem. So um, I've lost my train of thought in a way. But anyway, what I was trying to say from that was that if you, if those animals are treated earlier with the with the with the uh, help of a veterinary behaviourist. Um, then those animals might have some of their neurochemistry tweaked to allow a better, uh, less stress-affected brain, and therefore the learning, um, the learning can can occur. 
you know, for the calm behaviors that you want. I mean, the problem, the problem with a stressed brain is that the stress impairs the learning. And it does that by flooding the brain with cortisol. And cortisol is a chemical that attaches itself to areas of learning in the brain and then stops that learning from occurring. So, I mean... (laughs) There's, a, there's areas in the brain that are always obviously neuroplastic and can change, but there's the biggest change in, in, in the brain happens at social maturing in terms of myelination and pruning. And they're two things that occur in an adolescent brain that actually we want, we want to ensure that at that point in time, we're doing the best we can to enhance the calm areas of the brain and the thinking areas areas of the brain rather than if we miss that social maturing phase where we practice lots of reactivity then likely that those that reactivity becomes quite enhanced at that point um and, and see, often people are, are waiting over that social maturing phase. So that's happening somewhere between one and three years. And, and they're waiting for the dog to kind of naturally calm down. But in actual fact, if you've got an anxiety related disorder, you're actually getting worse over the age of one to three. And that's generally when they come to see us over that period between one and three. And they go, oh, you know, this dog's just not, not maturing like my other dogs have. Um, And yet, so if we start treating that dog, say if it's closer to the one year of age, if we start treating that dog effectively at one years of age, I feel like I can sometimes really improve that dog a lot so that by the time it's reached the end of social maturing phase, we might even start taking the med away because, you know, we've done a a decent job and the brain is okay. But if the dog comes in and it's at the end of social maturing, maybe it's three or four, um, um, the brain's now mature. It's not doing as much changing as it was. All of that social maturing phase is practiced and, and succeeded in <laughs> developing more reactivity. It's much harder to 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 expect the medication to um, make it make as much um, a positive difference. I won't say it won't help, but we won't have maybe as much success, and we might need meds for much much longer because because we have to support the brain. There's a thing where I think it maybe I'm not sure if it's from human medicine or where it's from, but it, you know, however long it took you to 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 create the problem, you need that time to. <laughs> to treat the problem so you know if you're four years old you're going to take another four years to get you back on track you're going to be an eight-year-old dog I mean that's not a very attractive (laughs) scenario for people is it but it can be very slow behavior change and so um you know I think the earlier you begin you you if the earlier you begin you cut down on certainly the practice and rehearsal of the behavior you don't want right so that's good the brain is more malleable yeah I think there's lots of reasons to begin earlier as opposed to waiting and seeing. I mean, we we see that people get obviously frustrated as well. You know, the longer that they've dealt with a problem, the more the client is frustrated, the more they might have turned to to aversive methods through their own frustration. Um, and therefore, trust has been lost. The dogs become confused. The dog's now suspicious of them. You know, and then you have a whole lot of unlearning to do before you start the new learning. So there's many, many good reasons to involve um, as many people as you can in in the right behaviour path as early as possible. I mean, we do see young animals that, you know, have been referred to us and we go, you know what, you're fine. You're going to be fine. We're just going to put some more consistency in here and and get everybody in the family on the same page. And, you, you know, your dog doesn't need to be medicated. This is fine. And, you know, it's not like we choose to medicate every animal. But when when we do see animals that 
through their body language are showing us that they're excessively worried about benign behavioral, uh, benign environmental change that the body and the brain should see as background, then we know we have a brain that is wired to perceive threat when threat's not there. And that is my, that is the big thing that makes me think you will do better if you're medicated because you need to have a brain that isn't firing off as if everything is life-threatening because when you're actually in that mode you actually can't attend to maybe training cues right <laughs> because you you've got too much adrenaline going on and you've got too much flight and fight going on so I'm not able to hear you I'm not able to listen to you one of the big things we see in behavior questionnaire is when we ask the question tell me about the personality of your dog and if they write he's stubborn it's a big one for me. I go, aha, uh-huh, there's my poor learner. Because, you know, dogs are not stubborn. Dogs don't choose to ignore you because they want to. <laughs> they don't do that. They ignore you or are perceived as stubborn because they actually are too worried about something else. So, yeah, um, stubborn is a, is a is an interesting one for me because I I will read that and interpret that as this is a stressed brain. So interesting, and so um, that that is why I'm so excited we got to do this episode today because my level of analysis when I hear the word stubborn is to get all ABA on it. But I right. <laughs> I, which which is value and has its place, but I, I'm I'm just thrilled that via our podcast show we get to explore uh, how your brain perceives the word stuff and from your level of analysis, mm. it's, it's exciting to to collaborate and to to learn about these things. For now, though, we're gonna uh, head towards mm. the end of part one of this two part episode with Nicole. In our subsequent mm. episode, Nicole will draw from her awesome knowledge and experience to talk more about her work as a behaviour vet. And she's going to kindly share with us five things she would like trainers to know about working with veterinarians who specialize in behavior. Before we finish up, though, Nicole, yeah. can you share with the listeners of the show? Uh, maybe they're in Australasia, maybe they're in Perth, maybe they're on the other side of the country, maybe they're in a different country. If they wanted to uh, visit your website or get in touch with you, how would they do that? Where would they go? Yeah, so we have a website, Animal Sense. That's A N I M A L S E N S E dot com dot A U. And everything is available on the website. We have a, uh, like you said, I think there, Ryan, we have the, we do have a short video on there about why we medicate. And that could be useful for people who are trying to understand a little bit more about medication. Uh, We're on Facebook and we're on Instagram. Awesome. And all, that's all Animal Sense on Facebook and Instagram? Uh, yep. Animal Sense, Animal underscore Sense underscore Vet on Instagram and Animal Sense Veterinary Behaviour, I think, on Facebook. We'll, li- <laughs> we'll link sure. to it on the show notes anyway, so we'll yeah, make it nice and sure. easy for you. Yeah. Hey, thanks yeah. so much for sharing everything so far, Nicole. We love hearing about mm-hmm. people's behavioural odysseys, as we like to call them. So we're grateful for you sharing that for now, though. Uh, for part one, Nicole, this has been so much fun. Thank you for Great. coming to hang out with us at Animal Training Academy today. Thanks, Ryan. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, Then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.